Good evening. I'm Courtney Graham with the Engagement Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening's virtual member lecture featuring Richard Schiff and Caitlin Haskell. We're so glad to have you, our members, joining us virtually. And while we wish that we could welcome you in person, we hope that this digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. We'll begin with a brief review of the features we'll be using today. This program will be shared in presentation mode, so we have turned off video and microphones for attendees. For optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under view options in the top right corner of your screen. Throughout the presentation, you're invited to share questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We look forward to answering some of those at the end of the presentation. Closed captions are available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during today's program, again, please let us know in the Q&A and we'll do our best to assist you. This program is being recorded, so if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll be welcome to do so. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Richard Schiff is the F.E. Marie Kane Regents Chair in Art at the University of Texas at Austin, where he directs the Center for the Study of Modernism. Richard's scholarly interests range broadly across the field of modern and contemporary art, with emphasis on French 19th century painting and post-war and contemporary American and European art. He has been particularly involved with theory and criticism, and his extensive publications include Cezanne and the End of Impressionism, Critical Terms for Art History, Barnett Newman, A Catalogue Renaissance, Doubt, Between Sense and de Kooning, and Sensuous Thoughts, Essays on the Works of Donald Judd. His recent essays have focused on Joan Mitchell, Jack Witten, Julie Moretu, Peter Saul, Frank Bowling, among others. Joining him today to discuss an installation of works by Barnett Newman and Alberto Giacometti is the museum's own Caitlin Haskell, the Gary C. and Francis Comer Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art. Thank you both so much for being here. I'll turn things over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Courtney. Um, and Richard, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Caitlin. I'm, I'm very thrilled that we're broadcasting live from the Center for the Study of Modernism uh, in Austin. <laughs> we are. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I want to I wanna actually dive right in um, and, and talk about this gallery, this Barnett Newman and Giacometti Gallery. Um, and what, what brings us here is, is actually a very special loan, uh, the loan of the painting Uriel uh, from 1955 by Barnett Newman, which you're, you're seeing on the screen. It's the eight foot high by 18 foot wide painting that's in almost all of these views. Um, and you know, back in January, February, um, I had the pleasure of working on this installation with Ann Goldstein. Um, and you know, we thought that it would be worth you know, talking about this because it's, it's almost like a small exhibition that is sort of a, a capstone to our presentation uh, on the third floor of the modern wing. And I mean, for, for people in the audience, I'll just say you know, a couple of reasons, you know, why, why would you do a, a gallery bringing together Barnett Newman and Giacometti? Um, why would you make this sort of two artist space? Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that Newman and Giacometti are, are basically exact contemporaries. Uh, Newman, born in New York, dies, dies in New York, but he lives from 1905 to 1970. Giacometti's life dates are 1901 to 1966. But what's interesting is that even though they have the same lifespan and, and because of that similar sort of reference points, like experiences, broadly speaking, one is active in Europe and, and the other is active um, in the US. Um, both artists also work at the extremes of scale, both, both um, in the most comp compressed and, and expanded formats. Um, they're both rather philosophically inclined um, and particularly would have a, a connection to existentialism. Um, each artist has a significant shift or sort of realization in their work of the mid 1940s, which leads to a very iconic um, body of work or style. 
And finally, what's, what's interesting maybe um, for, for people who, who do visit the, the Art Institute and, and go through the modern way is that each artist in one way or another has a relationship to, to surrealism. Um, Newman sort of more of a reaction against surrealism than an affiliation with surrealism as, as Giacometti has, but we thought that they could be very interesting as sort of um, a space where you're sort of leave, leaving the Art Institute surrealism galleries and, and entering something new. Um, so those are some of the reasons that make this sort of an interesting pairing or a relevant pairing. Um, but maybe what's most consequential is that you know, when you're in the same space, these objects work on you in really interesting ways together. Uh, and I think that was what was really most exciting and, and enjoyable for me. And you know, back, back in January, when the museum was closed to the public, I just had one of these sort of wow moments, like, I can't believe I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, being able, I'm able to install Uriel. And um, I was walking back to my office at, at the end of the day. And um, I sent Richard, I sent you an, an email. And um, this is something that I almost never do. I think I've done this twice in the past 10 years, but it was an email that had the, the subject line, career highlight. Um, and I was, you know, just saying, like, look at what we installed today. And you responded immediately and, um, and said, maybe the greatest painting of all time, certainly my favorite Newman, which, which I loved. And um, so with that, Richard, I thought, you know, maybe you could start by telling us about why, why you love this particular Newman painting so much and why you've chosen to write about it at, at several points in your career. Yeah, um, Caitlin, when you sent me that email, I, you know, I thought, how, how did you manage this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's such a, such a great uh, <laughs> room, uh, you know, having Uriel there and also having the Giacometti's there and, and building on the, uh, the Newmans that were already in the collection. Uh, and you've got uh, Giacometti in depth as well. Um, Let's let's go back to the uh, this is the that was uh, the black and white was Uriel in uh, in Newman's studio and this is Uriel uh, you know hanging uh, at the Art Institute right now. Yeah. So I I've got a long history with this painting and and it probably is my favorite painting of all time. I you know my the competition would be Goya for me. <laughs> you know, Goya, Goya or Newman. Um, but of all the Newmans, you know, this is the one that always struck me, struck the deepest chord for me. And then when I found out some things about it, I was even more impressed uh, be, because it's uh, Newman's own chatter about this, his joking about this painting, uh, reveals his intelligence. So, I mean, there are a number of things I'd like to say, and I don't, you know, I probably shouldn't go on too long, but first of all, the, you know, the title, Uriel, God is my light, is usually the translation of that that's given. One thing we have to keep in mind about uh, Newman's titles is that they usually post-dated the creation of the work. They were sometimes arrived at with contributions by other people. And Newman liked the titles to be mysterious. So the titles are not necessarily clues to the meaning of the work. They are an additional bit of wordplay, which Newman always enjoyed. And uh, the meaning of the work, if we want to think of it that way, is Newman would say it's the emotion that's in this work. It's what you feel when you look at it. It's what I, the artist, felt. But more than that, it's what you feel, because what you feel is different from what I feel. And he tended to think of, of works as bridges between people. So mm -hmm. this, this work, I, I first saw it. I don't know the circumstances, why it was there. It was in the Metropolitan Museum, and it was by itself. It was not a Newman's MoMA retrospective in 1971. Mm -hmm. But it was sometime later hanging in the Metropolitan Museum. 
And I came upon it not knowing it was there and never having seen it before. And I just thought immediately, this is the greatest movement I've ever seen. And every time I've seen it since then, I've thought the same. So I wish I could be there now looking at it. Uh, the last time I saw it, it was hanging for a couple, probably a couple of years in uh, the Byler collection mm -hmm. in Basel. Right. It, and it was uh, owned then by uh, Mr. Onash. And I remember meeting Onash one time in Berlin. And I looked at him like he was a god because the only thing I knew about him was that he was the owner of Uriel. And, right. you know, that. <laughs> meant you know this man is special <laughs> and i also entered the first owner alan power i'll say something right. ab about how this was painted in a minute but the first owner alan power um got it in 1964 having attempted to purchase it from newman in maybe 1962 61 62 when he paid his first visit to uh, mm -hmm. Newman's studio. And Alan Power was young, he was in his 20s. And he came there to buy a Newman. His father had already gotten a couple of Newmans. And, um, and Alan Power <laughs> said, I'll take that one. And it yeah. was Ur Uriel. <laughs> yeah. and, and Newman said, you can't have that one. You're too yeah. young. <laughs> Yeah. You won't. <laughs> you won't understand it. <laughs> um, it's a great so, story. Yeah. <laughs> and then he let him have it a little bit later, and then it had to be shipped to London, where Ellen Power lived. Right. And the big question, you know, could it be crated, which was a safer way to do it, but very expensive, or could it safely be unstretched and then stretched again? And Which is what they chose to do, right? They cho yeah, they chose to do that. And in part because there were um, two painters, Harold and Bernard Cohen in London, who were famous for being the best stretchers in the world. You know, mm -hmm. extremely skillful, who could get a big painting like this restretched very precisely. Perfectly, yes. Uh, which, which is what someone like Newman required. Um, and Newman joked about this later on when he was, a little bit later on, when he was interviewed by Harold uh, Cohen for, it was actually part of, it ended up being part of a BBC program. And Newman was quoted as, when asked about this painting, he said, to justify it, I wanted to see how far I could stretch it before it broke, meaning that blue-green color, cerulean blue, or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. how far he could stretch it before it broke. And of course, that was a pun because Harold Cohn had stretched the canvas, and right. Newman, <laughs> Newman was stretching the color. Um, and I want to say a little bit more about that, but, but Caitlin, I, you should enter intercede here a bit because I don't want to take up all the time. Well, it's, no, I mean, it's, it's great to hear you talk about this. It's, and it's, I'm, I'm glad that you're talking about the way the painting is stretched because I had the chance last week to be in the gallery with uh, two of the museum's paintings conservators, um, Alison Langley and, and Katrina Rush. I, I know you know both of them from previous projects on Newman and other artists. Um, but um, it, the painting is in like, almost pristine condition. And when you look mm. at it, like there's there's no sense that it's been restretched other than the story that we knew that, you know, Newman goes to London because the painting has to be restretched and this the story that, that you're telling and, and then the, the wonderful sort of anecdote about um, how far are we going to stretch this this blue green color before it breaks. And Maybe that would be actually sort of another another sort of area of, of discussion around this this painting, Richard, would be to talk about um, the palette, very distinctive palette that we find here, and also um, you know some some of the ways that light comes through, um, it, and you know we we can talk about sort of the the area where the color is in this area of zips and interchanges, but mm. it's it's um, it, there's also sort of a sense I think of 
some of the qualities of the canvas, the bare canvas almost like resonating and, and um, being used to sort of um, to lighten in some ways. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, uh, you're absolutely right. It's an amazingly fresh painting. And, and uh, when I was looking at it in Basel some years ago, that was what struck me. Uh, because I, pro I, well, I had seen it, it all, it was also shown at Hauser and Wars in, in New York mm -hmm. because they showed the whole Onash collection. Um, but it, yes, it always looked fresh. Of course, Newman in, in general, I mean, he was a superb craftsman mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so uh, his paintings are good. They're well made. And around 1954, 55, he used these colors. He used a lot of this cerulean blue. And mm -hmm. uh, um, where the, the zip area is, where the black is, and then another band of blue green, and then a, uh, the brown and the white, the white on top of the brown, uh, that really vibrates that area. But the, I wanna link this to, to Giacometti a bit because, mm -hmm. What, when Newman said I wanted to uh, see how far I, I could stretch it before it broke, I mean, it's interesting that although that's a very colloquial statement, you know, before something broke, um, you, it would be more proper to say, I wanted to see how far I could, I could stretch it before I broke it, not right. it broke itself. And what it indicates is, and this is very true to Newman, that the painting was always, as he worked on a painting, the painting was always talking back to him and teaching mm -hmm. him something about himself. So he mm -hmm. was learning that color and how far that color could be extended. That 18 inch dimension is a dimension he used quite a few times. So he's familiar, uh, sorry, 18 feet. 18 foot, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so he's familiar with that scale. And obviously, you know, he had the canvas, he, he painted on stretch canvas as opposed to painting on the floor the way some of the abstract expressionists did. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's familiar with the format, but he doesn't know how far he can push that side of the painting. And he does it until he can't go any further. And then he uses the other colors. So there's a, a sense of the moment. It's like a title that Newman used for one or two paintings, moment. Mm -hmm. um, always a sense of, uh, of the tension of nowness, of being, of having to make a decision and right. your decision being guided by the situation. So we could right. talk about situationism or the you know, situational uh philosophy mm -hmm. and and existentialism it's all very consistent uh the world that Giacometti was living in is is very consistent with the the world that Newman chose to live in which was very much an anti-formalist world you know he wasn't he said over and over again I'm not interested in geometry mm -hmm. I don't work out the proportions you know I feel them out he was very proud of the fact that he could bisect a canvas precisely, do it by mm -hmm. eye and do thirds if he wanted. Part of his tailoring experience because he grew right. up with that. So, um, you know, there, there's this sense that you have to let the materials guide you or the material world speak back to you your situation in the world speaks back to you. And then that allows you to feel something, to feel an emotion mm -hmm. and to um, put it somehow into a work of art. But the emotion comes out of the work as much as it, as it goes into it. It's not Barnett Newman saying, this is me, this painting is me, but it's also Uriel saying, you know, I am becoming Barnett Newman, or, right. you know, Barnett Newman is becoming Muriel. Yeah. It's interesting, Richard, that you sort of talk about um, Newman working in an, an intuitive way, that it's a very sort of um, 
sort of personal process that he's that, that's guiding him and that it, it, he's being guided by sensation because one of the things that I think really comes out in the gallery when you're in front of this painting is um, obviously sort of the the presence of the work but also the hands you know even in the blue green area which looks fairly consistent on the slides there is a sense that it's applied by brush and you get that when you um, come to the areas of zips there so the blue green sort of terminates and allows through just a little bit of uh, the, the bare canvas and you, you see some some marks of the brush and then you've got just really almost perfectly um, measured balanced areas of black the blue green again and then um, the white, which creates an area of brown of equal measure of the black and, and the blue green there. And there really is sort of a sense of um, coordination, but also still a bit of spontaneity there. And of course, you'll, you'll remember as well that Newman signs the work in kind of an unconventional place, which, would, which is just to the, to the right of the white um, painted zip. So sort of more, um, mm. more central than you would usually have. But I guess let's, um, in the interest of time, and since we, we have just five works in the gallery, uh, I want to make sure that we get to, to all of them. Let's move now, Devin, I think, to, I think it'll be slide 17, will be um, showing us the two other, perfect, um, the two other Newman paintings. So we have um, the beginning from uh, 1946 on the left, um, and on the right we have Untitled Three from 1950. And, um, you know, seeing these together, Richard, it, what, what are some thoughts that uh, that come to mind for, for you? Well, that's, you know, they represent uh, the, the big leap that that Newman made where he abandoned a lot of the variation that was in the earlier works, like using a diagonal. Right. And um, and and then focused on the vertical. Uh, and I mean, even in 46, he he wasn't introducing any horizontals because he was, he always thought that um, the problem with Mondrian was that Mondrian wa always wanted everything to be balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you had a vertical, you had to have a horizontal. And Newman wanted to just get rid of the whole Western tradition, really, of, of composition. Mm -hmm. and make a mark, uh, make a gesture. Uh, I mean, he referred to making a world with these paintings because they were, they didn't have a history. They mm -hmm. were independent of the past. And in the forties, he was experimenting with the vertical bars that are tapered, vertical bars that are not tapered and right. diagonal bars and all of, and also the uh, brush variations and all of that is in the beginning and it has that curious bit of brushing out on the bottom right where mm -hmm. the you know it's as if he thinks that white zip or whatever we want to call it is too strong and mm -hmm. he partially obliterates it so it doesn't come all the way down to the bottom he did that in a number of paintings of 46 47 he would have a a bar that went down but didn't go all the way down. And then in the, the next slide in uh, untitled um, number three, of, of course, you've simply got uh, two bands with a, a brushy edge between them of uh, cadmium red and silvery gray. Mm -hmm. And he's eliminated the, let's say the environment for right. those gestures and um, and simply let the the vertical take over and be the work. And he was very he made, as you know, he made six of these and of, of this the so-called skinny paintings, and was extremely proud of the fact that he pulled this off. And the the frame, the uh, that box that contains the painting was Jackson Pollock's work, his exactly. close friend at, at the time. And there are the six. Yep. I was gonna say, Richard, it's, it's funny because when I look at that wall and think about it in the, the space of the gallery, the beginning as, as a work from 1946 has a lot of 
conversation partners, sort of when we were going through the, the installation views, we have uh, a, um, a 1946 painting by Pollock, uh, the key. We have a 1946 painting by Norman Lewis in this space. We have a 1946 painting by Arshel Gorky. But I think the, the fact that, you know, ja that Jackson Pollock created the frame on number three is such, such an interesting story. And, um, you know, going back to that day when we were installing the space, I remember um, some of the some of the art handlers, some of the preparators had been there first. And it, this was just sort of on on a cart, you know, laying on its on its back. And it just has such delicacy that the, the analogy, it was, it was almost like a violin or some sort of like stringed instrument that, you know, was so kind of perfect. Um, and also what's so fascinating about this in the space of the gallery is that um, while it's a while it's a painting, it, it behaves very much like like a sculpture, you know, on the on the wall. Um, and I guess would you be able to talk a, a little bit about um, you know, some of the um, some of the reasons that you know over a, a ten year period, Barnett Newman might have gone from a work like The Beginning, which resembles an easel picture in some ways, to these very um, extreme formats of you know a painting that's about three inches wide like like number three and then a painting that's eight, 18 feet wide like Uriel. Yeah I think you know I think he was thinking of these works as objects mm -hmm. um, as you know I mean you could think of them as painted sculptures but but just objects so I mean it's it's the reason that somebody like Frank Stella revered Newman um, mm -hmm. Frank Stella beginning to make object-like paintings in 1959, 1960. Um, and and Newman's, Newman was achieving right around that time, he was finally achieving real recognition. Um, Uriel was, uh, you know, 55, and it, it was an end point for Newman because he didn't produce anything and fix 56 and then in, mm -hmm. he had his heart attack I think in 57 um, and then he didn't work again until 59 so there's and the works of the 60s are more formal I would say than the works of the 40s and 50s but in the 40s and 50s you know right between these two paintings we would place one meant one of right. 19, 1948 and Newman had made small paintings which had only a single zip or you know single vertical in them earlier but they were just part of a group and he didn't regard them as different from the beginning of work like this which is uh bigger than some of them and um and more complicated mm -hmm. and then he made the small painting which had a single band down the middle and he studied it for eight months and because it, it puzzled him. This is what he said anyway, yeah. that, and, and he didn't know whether it was a painting or not. It's, you know, it reminds us of the Jackson Pollock anecdote where he would ask Lee Krasner, he would do something and then ask Lee Krasner to tell him whether it was okay or not, because it might be too wild. <laughs> and, and Newman, Newman had uh, similar moments like that, and uh, he was always respected by Pollock and Tony Smith. They were buddies, and mm -hmm. um, and Ad, Ad Reinhardt also, and then they had a fall, falling out. He had a falling out with, probably would have had a falling out with Pollock, but Pollock died before <laughs> they could have their falling out. Um, well, I was just going to say, Richard. So, um, you know, uh, you know, with with the beginning, I think that's entry maybe four in the catalog raisonné. It it almost is, you know, the very sort of beginning of his painterly practice. But one aspect mm. of Newman that you've worked on a lot is that you know he was really quite an accomplished and serious writer. You know, before right. he became a painter, and um, you were you were talking a little bit about the work that you did. Um, you know, in, in researching this, this publication, um, what was it that drew you to Newman's writings um, 
you know, as, as a scholar yourself? Well, they were, you know, Newman was always famous. There, there was always a lot of lore about Newman because of some of the wisecracks that he made, like, you know, uh, what is it, ornithology, let's see, uh, uh, art criticism is to art as ornithology is to the birds. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> things like that. And, and they were just quoted all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I, I worked my first job, I was working in an art school. So, you know, the, the students knew all these things about Newman. Mm -hmm. And and that was back in the early 70s. And Newman had only just died. But right. those those things were known about Newman because they'd been passed on by other artists. Uh, and then I and a few of the writings were reproduced and they were printed in Thomas Hess's monograph on Newman. And then I discovered, um, well, Anna Lee Newman had this project of putting the writings together in a volume. And then I discovered all the unpublished ones and they were mm -hmm. fantastic or ones that had been short pieces that had been published but had been forgotten. And they were just so smart. So, you know, I, I, I just felt that Newman was a brilliant writer and extremely insightful with regard to the history of modern art. And, you know, his rival in my mind would be another artist who admired him so much, and that would be Donald Judd. Donald right. Judd in his writing had the same quality of being able to put together in three paragraphs, something that was smarter than a whole book. Well, on, on the topic of, um brilliant artists and, and very thoughtful um, writing about art. Let's, let's shift now to the, to the other side of the gallery, to the east side, and spend some time with the sculptures of Giacometti. And um, Devin, that will be slide 24, if you've got that. And um, when you're looking at these works, so the um, two, two sculptures, the, the work on the right, um, we'll, we'll discuss first. Um, Tall figure from from 1947, and when we were discussing, you know, the possibility of having a conversation, Richard, we we thought that you know one of the absolute things that we would want to discuss is is the 1948 exhibition at Pierre Matisse Gallery, um, which featured this sculpture, in fact, um, and was accompanied by um, an essay by by Sark, um, kind of bringing us back, of course, to these mm. issues of of existentialism. But I wondered if you know, what, something that I really admire um, about your your writing and, and your thinking is that you tend to be guided by the object and the artist. So wh what is it about Giacometti's sculpture that kind of brings us into the realm of existentialism um, in, in your view? Well, it's, you know, for, for me, it's it's the tenuousness of it. The, the uh, I mean, these, I don't think these, bronzes are fragile, but they give the impression of being fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, even with know. the very heavy base too. I yeah, even, even, yeah, even, even with the heavy base. And, and the heavy base, of course, you know, generates a, a formal contrast, which is interesting. Um, and we don't, we're, we're probably short of time. We don't need to go to the Newman sculpture, but Newman got the, I, probably got the idea for his sculpture from, from Giacometti, his sculpture of 1950. Um, but the, it's the, the um, tension in the contour of these Giacometti sculptures and the surface quality of it, which mm -hmm. does make them like a Newman zip in the sense that Newman, when he used masking tape to get the line straight, he didn't always, but usually he used masking tape. He let it bleed because it was in the nature of the tape. I mean, he could have sealed it, but he didn't. He would let it bleed. So there would be a, an element of risk there. He never knew exactly how the edge was going to appear. And Giacometti gives that impression of working the plaster or the clay uh, with the hands with the fingers Absolutely. so that it's 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 very delicate and 
it becomes it also becomes a kind of forceful gesture because it's it's a human figure either standing or striding um and you know having it there with uriel made me think of something i'd never thought of before that these figures are stretched and they're stretched to the point probably where they're about to break in, in absolutely yeah but that, so, that's so interesting yeah yeah go, go i'll let you finish your thought well it's just it's it's the the sense of existential risk that is mm -hmm. that is built into a Giacometti sculpture and you know uh he had his surrealist period and the surrealist works are brilliant Giacometti's but you know, when Newman saw these, I doubt very much that he would think of them as having anything to do with surrealism, which, which Newman really didn't like, but he did like Giacometti. And you know, I think he would think of these as uh, being gestures that were risky and right. sen sensitive to the material. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're absolutely in the surface qualities that you were describing. Uh, there, there's not only a sense of hand, but there's, um, you know, some people will say they seem like they've been charred in some way or through fire, but there's just, there's, there's such a, um, the, there's so much information in the surface that it, it, it's almost akin to sensation in some way, if that doesn't sound too crazy, almost in the, you know, right. that there's a lot of feeling that is just simply present on, on the surface. Um, and I think another way that the risk um, comes through in, in the space of the gallery is, is really just sort of how exposed they are. Um, I mean, to have them that sort of directly um, placed on the ground, and actually you're, you're seeing here a, a previous installation where you would come across the works um, from the side, and obviously there's sort of different aspects of the sculptures that that come out. You know, the walking man seems to be striding more in a more pronounced way um, when you approach from the side. But if we go back to the previous slide, Devin, uh, or maybe two slides back now, where you can see, um, yeah, this, you know, one of the things that was really, I think, appealing to us when we were installing the space was really having a, a longer distance um, where you're, you're you're seeing the work from from further away, and there's this sense that they're always always diminishing, you know, visually and also materially. That there's a, a sense that they're going to almost um, evaporate or you know not be there at, at at some moment. Yeah, you. I mean, you have to let them create a void where they are, so you, as if they are in a void. And, right. and yeah, you know, and you've you've got them spaced so that it's good to have the white behind them also. That very new neutral gallery space really, I think, bring, brings out the quality in in those works. Um, you know, in in your mind, compare compare that walking figure to Rodin's walking man, and right. you know, uh, so so different. So one so late 19th century really in, in the sense of the person or the, the solidity of the body and here post-war Giacometti mm -hmm. a, after the bomb and everything else. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the works that the, the Giacometti's are um, in, in dialogue with and, and for a period of time, we had um, some some wire sculptures, soldered wire works by the artist Richard Hunt that you know I think were also really sort of wonderful in this space. Um, we ended up shifting them um, to an adjacent gallery where you can sort of still have the sense of of Giacometti nearby, but you know that um, that sense of openness and sort of spareness and creating a void was was really key for getting the works to. Um, for, for creating the effects that you want them to have uh, on, a, on a viewer in the space. Um, I was just getting a, a chat and a note from, um, from the producers that were getting closer to Q&A. And I know, Richard, that you wanted to talk about the, the work of an artist that you've been writing about recently, um, Frank Bowling. So maybe should we advance um, to, to that? And I know we'll come back to go into greater depth with both Newman and Giacometti um, in, in the Q&A, but 
you were you were so, wanting to talk about a, a painting of his um, that will be um, slide forty nine for us, Devin. Yeah, I I thought this was interesting because uh, it's Frank Bowling's um, homage to uh, Barney Newman, and it's it's nineteen sixty eight, and you know who's afraid of Barney Newman and uh, Newman had produced paintings with the title Who's Afraid of Re Red, Yellow, and Blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and those paintings originally had the title Who's Afraid of Jasper Johns. Exactly. <laughs> so that was Newman yeah. commenting on Jasper Johns. And here's Frank Bowling commenting on Newman. But one of the things that uh, uh, Bowling is a very interesting artist because he uses referential imagery. And then he says, well, it's not really referential. I, I need to put something in there. And um, so he's got within this Newman-like, zip-like painting in non-Newman-like colors, he's got the contour lines of South America mm -hmm. where he was born and grew up. He was from what was then British Guyana. And he had his art, career in New York and London, still working in London now. He's in his late 80s, I think, mid 80s, right. late 80s. But what he did was, you know, once the, the map is in there, you've got a reference. And that was precisely what Newman always wanted to remove from exactly. his paintings. So they'd be feeling and nothing else, no discourse, no philosophy, just human feeling relating one person to another. And Bowling was very, Bowling was really part of the New York school in the late 1960s and uh, interested in color field painting. But he also felt that he needed an image to hold on to, kind of like de Kooning had the same right. idea. And so it's, you know, it's both pro-Newman and anti-Newman. And that, that's why I think it's interesting. And it's also, of course, Bowling is a, um, a Black artist and always very conscious of the migration from Africa to slave migration from Africa to South America. So the South American maps, sometimes he uses an African map. Mm -hmm. It has that kind of content built into it as do these colors, which he associates with, or people associate with Africa. Frank Bowling would just say, I like those colors. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have um, a lot of the, the discourse that, we're, that concerns us now, as we um, are so focused on what constitutes an artistic identity or an aesthetic identity. There's a lot built into this, what this comparison that we could make between Frank Bowling and Barnett Newman or even Giacometti. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I, I'm seeing um, Courtney um, pop up here and we've got a number of questions um, I've seen from, from lots of, folks in the audience. So do you want to start us out, Courtney, with a question and Richard and I can respond? Yes, absolutely. And, and first off, thank you for, for such a great conversation. Um, our, our first audience question, um, do you think that Barnett Newman was anti-composition? Hmm, Richard, I'll let you field that one. Well, yeah, I mean, he, uh, yes, he was anti-composition or you could say he, yes, he was anti-composition. Um, and, and so was Ellsworth Kelly, for example. Um, there, were, there were a number, and so was Frank Stella. I mean, there were a number of artists who you could probably say that Ad Reinhardt was anti-composition. Uh, I mean, there was such a feeling that, there was such a, a feeling that Western culture had collapsed, uh, that World War II was the, was the proof that Western culture had collapsed that anything associated with, um, you know, I even, I even thought of Eve Klein, you know, The Leap Into mm -hmm. the Void, 1960. Sure. That's, that's another performance artists were anti-composition. So uh, people trying to make a gesture 
in a more forceful way and not having it be moderated by what we call composition. Right. And just to follow up on that, I wonder if that um, question might have been prompted, Richard, when you said that Newman was um, anti-formalist. And do you want to maybe kind of compare and contrast those terms? How would you differentiate between your remark that Newman wasn't a formalist and this question about to what extent is he interested in composition? Yeah. So, I mean, for Newman's I, sense of formalism and, and most people really was, was that, I mean, what the reason that you champion formalism is because it's a way of being analytical about art. And so, I mean, I, there weren't too many artists who were formalists. There were a lot of critics who were formalists because uh, formal analysis comes out of structuralism, early 20th century structuralism was a way of, of um, connecting um, the, a critical discourse to the work of art. It, it was a pathway to understanding. And Newman didn't want a pathway. He wanted a more direct kind of connection with mm -hmm. a viewer. You know, you didn't need to translate a Newman into formal language. You just either got it or you didn't get it. Yeah, I, um, that's reminding me of uh, a quote from, from your book, Doubt, which deals with, with Uriel, um, where you say, um, the more aggressive among the modern artists were challenging the public directly. So you think you want physical existence, well, here's the real stuff, deal with it. <laughs> which I've always loved that <laughs> sentence, but I think that kind of resonates with what you were, were saying mm. there. Sure, thanks, Caitlin, yeah. for finding uh, that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and perhaps related, um, Richard, we have a couple of questions asking about the emotions that, that Uriel evokes and, and what some of the feelings are that are coming up for you when you look at the work? If you could talk a little about that. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's a, it's a kind of uh, sensory overload. It just, it, um, I mean, it's not a, that is not a, not a tragic painting for me and it's not a comedic painting for me. It's, uh, it's just profoundly sensuous. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's like, uh, it, it clears the mind. I mean, there, there are probably times when you don't want your mind to be cleared out, but if you do, if you wanna be, I mean, I would go look at, if I were the owner of Muriel, uh, or if I were in Chicago right now, and I wanted to cure a headache, I would go look at Muriel. Um, and, and, you know, so I would, I would associate uh, that sensuosity with, with an emotional state. I mean, there are uh, paintings that Newman, I think, thought of as being somehow having a sense of the tragic. Um, they tend to be, uh, you know, I would say the large horizontal paintings tend to be more joyous than tragic. Some of the vertical paintings probably might make you feel a little bit anxious. The um, proportional relations of the elements within them are extreme. Also Newman, you know, did not want to produce traditional color harmonies, which is one of the reasons I think he was attracted to that cerulean blue and and the black and the brown. I mean, those are, it's an odd combination of colors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're not pretty and they're not ugly. I mean, they're, they, they don't um, fall into line very easily. And so you can have a very original response to them, a fresh response. Yeah. I think I might also respond to that question by saying that the, the meaning of the painting, um, it can change with its surroundings. You know, and um, when we were installing the work, we tried it at several different heights and ultimately hung it just 
14 inches off the ground, which is just a, a little bit higher than the, um, the, the base of the, um, the tall figure by Giacometti. And I think there's, there really is sort of a sense of grounding and solidity and kind of um, a heaviness to it. But it's also interesting because we have, um, we have a bench in the gallery. I guess that would be sort of the sixth element in that space. And I, you, some, some people sit in front of it, but I think it's so much more interesting to, to walk and get up close and then get a little further away and uh, you know, ex examine the area of zips. And then you know, it's, it really is a very, it, it, um, it encourages me to, to move and think and kind of you know, coordinate thinking and movement together. Yeah, Newman uh, once said that he uh, he made large paintings that were intended to be see, to be seen up close. And right, right. yeah, and and so you know, providing a sense of immersion. So you, you know, you the natural position for a painting that size would be at a distance. Quite yeah, quite far away. Right. And but he wanted you also to to walk up to it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, there aren't, there aren't so many walls on the third floor of the modern wing where you can hang an 18 foot painting. Um, so that sort of helps us determine where it would go. And you, you can get far enough back to, to take it in sort of, you know, in your, in your field of vision. But I think the space also encourages you to get, um, to get a, a, you know, to have a sort of a more in, intimate interaction with the work. Yeah, I, that, that wall seems to be just the right size for that painting. We were pretty the, pleased with The wall with that, that you have it on. Yeah, it's so, I mean, there are two other kind of, I would say really, really large paintings that I was thinking about when we were installing. So we've got, of course, the great Matisse Bathers by a River, which is the first painting that mm. you see when you enter the floor um, from the south side. And um, Uriel's, um, I think it's, I think it's five feet wider than it, which is kind of incredible. And then the same thing with our, you know, our great um, Picabia painting. I mean, it, which also, you know, has its own wall, but but Uriel really kind of expands and has has like a truly architectural sort of heft to it. Um, that's that's interesting. Mm. Well, I, I hate to cut us off, but I think we are just about out of time. Thank you so much, Richard and Caitlin, for, for taking the time to speak with us this evening. Well, thank, thank you, you, Courtney. And, and I have to also take this moment, Richard, the next time I email you and say career <laughs> highlight, uh, I, ho I hope this can be our sign that I, I'll invite you to, to have a conversation afterwards. Oh. I feel like we can really keep going. <laughs> okay, okay, accepted, Caitlin. <laughs> okay, so thanks, Richard. many more career highlights for you, I hope. <laughs> Well, this, this is a great one and it's such a, such a joy to be in conversation with you and, and to be able to have uh, Uriel on, on view in this context um, for our members. Mm, terrific, yeah. Yes, yes, thank you both again and thank you to our members for joining us for tonight's program. We hope that many of you will get a chance to see the, the Newman and Giacometti works on view in the modern wing soon. Um, for more information on upcoming virtual events, please visit us online at artic.edu and look for our monthly e-news in your inboxes. We look forward to seeing you again soon.